This video is brought to you by Captivating History. What makes Eastern Europe different from Western Europe? Is it a tangible boundary? A different set of cultures? Was the distinction due to wars, political agendas, or religious beliefs? And why would I want to visit? We have a wealth of information about the history of Europe. However, for many, Eastern Europe is shrouded in mystery. Surrounded by famous historical empires and peoples like the Mongols, the Vikings, the Chinese, the Greeks, the Celts, and the Romans, the people of Eastern Europe are relatively obscure. The definition of Eastern Europe is contested, and which countries make up this region can fluctuate from both historical and political standpoints. Currently, the United Nations Statistic Division defines Eastern Europe as including the countries of Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Romania, the Russian Federation, Slovakia, and the republics of Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine. Some sources include countries formerly classified as Southern Europe, and others use the term to define European countries that were formerly part of the Eastern Bloc. During the Cold War, the term Iron Curtain was used to describe the separation of the East and the West, and before Germany was reunified, East Germany was often included as an Eastern European country. The prehistoric peoples of Eastern Europe are often linked to Scandinavia, as it seems they both had a similar lifestyle and timeline of advancements. From around 7500 to 3000 BCE, the Neolithic cultures developed pottery and agriculture. These two developments are usually linked with the emergence of settled villages. However, evidence suggests that the inhabitants of Eastern Europe remained as migratory hunter-gatherers despite having some successful farming techniques. In around 4500 BCE, the Kukutani Tripelia culture flourished in Ukraine and Romania. This culture displayed evidence of copper technology and is known for a distinctive style of pottery painted with monochrome wave-like patterns. After 2000 BCE, the people of Eastern Europe started to have more interactions with those in Central and Southern Europe. This contact brought metallurgy and horsemanship and broadened the opportunity for trade. Around 750 BCE is the first mention of Eastern Europeans in classic literature. The Greek poet Homer mentions the Sumerians that lived on the edge of the known world, near the entrance to the underworld. However, the origin of the Sumerians is disputed, with some believing they were from Eurasia. During the early medieval period, an Eastern European people called the Slavs began to migrate to the warmer climes of Central Europe to the west and the Balkans to the south. These tribes originated from the forests, steppes, and mountains of Eastern Europe and had unified before expanding into new territories. According to Byzantine historians, the Slavs would raid villages and cause general disruption in an area to pave the way for their people to settle the region. Once any opposition to them was dealt with, they would merge with any remaining people and integrate them into their tribes, absorbing any beneficial culture. Due to their integration of other cultures, their fighting style and weaponry became more diverse. They grew larger, enabling them to target bigger cities until the Byzantine Empire began to see them as less of a nuisance and more of a threat. To calm them, two scholars, called Cyril and Methodius, were sent to teach the Slavic people. They used the newly created Glagolitic alphabet and preached Orthodox Christian teaching and gospel. Cyril and Methodius successfully united the Slavic tribes with a mutual language and formed the Old Church Slavonic. Byzantium had a marked influence on Eastern Europe during the medieval era. Eastern Europe was at the junction of many different cultures, including Latin, Greek, and Islamic, and the borders that defined Eastern Europe were continually shifting. In Russia, then known as Kievan Rus, much of the medieval period was one of civil war, punctuated by periods of peace. Around 1219, the Mongols began to expand their territories. A council meeting in Kiev prompted the Mongols to send envoys requesting peace and asserting that they had not attacked Rus. However, the Rus princes, made suspicious from decades of civil wars, did not trust the Mongols and killed their emissaries, destroying any chance of peace. Under Batu Khan, the Mongols marched across Russia, looting and destroying cities as they went. The Mongols eventually reached Kiev, sacking it and changing Eastern Europe in many ways. The Mongols asserted that they were sent by God, a declaration that many Rus, or Russians, accepted as they saw the invasion as God punishing them for their sins. 
In the political power vacuum left by the humiliated princes, the Orthodox Church embodied national and religious identity. This factor was compounded by the Mongolian Ehrlich, a concept of legal immunity extended to the Church. This immunity protected the Church and made it exempt from paying taxes to either the Mongols or the Russians. The Orthodox Church began to consolidate land and power, placing it in a formidable position following the Mongolian takeover. Many parts of Eastern Europe were invaded by the Mongols, but were never truly conquered. Poland was able to defeat the Mongols by 1288. By the 1300s, Poland's strength had increased and was expanded in 1333 by King Casimir III, also known as Casimir the Great. Through diplomacy, Casimir annexed lands in western Russia and eastern Germany. He unified the government, allowed new towns to self-govern, and founded Poland's first university in Krakow in 1364. The Mongolian Empire dissolved in 1368, although some groups of Mongols continued to assert power. For instance, Russia remained a tributary of the Golden Horde, the Tartar and Mongol army led by descendants of Genghis Khan until 1480 when Ivan III declared he no longer recognized the Horde as an authority. But this was not the end of invasions in Eastern Europe. Further south, in 1453, another force had begun to assert itself, the Turks. With the fall of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire collapsed, allowing the Turkish Ottomans to expand into Eastern Europe unfettered. After Ivan the Great's reign, a Grand Prince of Moscow, Russia expanded by annexing principalities to the north, south, and west. By 1547, Russia had grown larger than any other European nation at the time, and Grand Prince Ivan IV became the first Tsar. At the age of three, Ivan ascended to the throne. At 16, he was crowned Tsar, and later became more commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. During the 15th and 16th centuries, Hungary suffered from internal fighting they fell into decline and decided not to pay taxes to fund an army. In 1526, Suleiman the Magnificent, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, attacked Hungary, which was subsequently split into three, Royal Hungary, ruled by the Austrian Habsburgs, Turkish Hungary, and Transylvania. Transylvania, meaning across the forest, maintained its independence by paying taxes to the Ottomans. Towards the end of the 16th century, two main powers dominated Eastern Europe. They were Poland to the north and the Ottoman Empire to the south. In 1569, Poland united with Lithuania, effectively creating a republic. The 17th century was a busy time with many changes taking place in Eastern Europe. Poland was involved in several wars, and in 1610, Polish forces occupied Moscow. Eventually, though the Cossacks originally supported Poland against the Turks, they became turncoats, enlisting the help of the Turks to help them rebel against Poland. In 1654, all hopes for Ukrainian independence were gone, as the sovereignty of Russia over Ukraine was recognized by the region. In 1655, Poland took another hit when Sweden invaded the weakened country. Despite eventually repelling the invaders, the long and brutal war had ravaged the nation. But they rebounded, helping in the decline of the Turkish Empire. In 1673 and 1683, under Hetman Sobieski, the Polish army defeated the Turks, who had to give up most of their gains during the previous hundred years. Towards the end of the 17th century, increased taxation and corruption within the Ottomans' administration began to cause more unrest amongst the region's people. After Hungary was freed from the Ottomans in 1699, it came under the control of the Austrian Habsburgs. Three new great powers arose in Eastern Europe during the 18th century. The Habsburgs controlled Austria, Bohemia, and Hungary. In 1701, the Kingdom of Prussia was founded by Frederick III of Brandenburg, also known as King Frederick I of Prussia. Russia was ruled by Peter the Great from 1682 to 1725. Peter's effect on Russia was all-encompassing. He saw that Russia had previously inhibited foreign relations and wanted to remedy this to promote the national economy. He initiated many reforms that touched every aspect of life in Russia. At the end of the 18th century, three territorial divisions of Poland reduced and divided the country until, in 1795, Poland was erased from the political map. These partitions started in 1772, after Russia entered the war against the Ottoman Turks in 1768, 
Austria became worried that they would expand into their territories and threatened to join the fight on the side of the Turks. Frederick II of Prussia, alarmed at the thought of an escalating Russo-Turkish war, directed Russia's attention towards Poland. On August 5, 1772, Prussia, Austria, and Russia agreed on a treaty that partitioned Poland. At the time, Poland was engaged in a civil war between the royals and the confederates. Russia aided the royals, while France and Turkey helped the confederates. These chaotic conditions created an opportunity for the surrounding countries to take advantage of the crisis. After the first partition was ratified by the same, the lower house of the bicameral parliament of Poland, which feared losing more territory, Poland lost around one-third of its land and population. Poland was cut off from its seaports, which allowed Prussia to control the Polish economy. Twenty years later, Poland had gained some strength through internal reforms, and on May 3, 1791, they adopted a more liberal constitution. However, this move caused the conservative Confederation of Targovica to form and asked Russia to help them restore the former constitution. Russia and Prussia took this as an invitation to help themselves to more Polish lands, and on January 23, 1793, they agreed to the second partition of Poland. Russian troops forced the same to give roughly 115,000 square miles to Russia and Prussia. This action led to a Polish national uprising. To quash the insurgents, Russia and Prussia agreed with Austria to divide up the remainder of Poland between them. The third partition of Poland was decided on October 24, 1795, but was not finalized until January 26, 1797. Poland would not become a country again until after World War I. World War I would radically change the map of Eastern Europe yet again. In Central, Southern, and Eastern Europe, tensions were rising, or at least were remaining as raised as they had been for centuries. Russia and France had formed an alliance against Germany and Prussia, but Russia engaged in a war with Japan, which was allied with both France and Britain. While France and Britain stayed out of this war and Japan prevailed, France convinced Russia to ally with Britain. Austria-Hungary was governing area still part of the Ottoman Empire, but they annexed their territory, which prompted the Slavic population to assert themselves. This action drew Russia to square up to Austria-Hungary and provided aid to the Slavs in the Balkans. Then the Russia-backed Balkan League of Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro attempted to take more territory from the Turks. Yes, a virtual merry-go-round. Subsequently, the Bulgarians fought the Greeks and Serbs over Macedonia, with the Ottoman Empire and Romania joining the fight against the Bulgarians. It is hardly surprising that this powder keg of power struggles exploded into world war. The event that lit the match was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914. Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were shot in their car by a young Serbian revolutionary called Gavrilo Princip. The Serbian extremists feared that Ferdinand was too moderate and would promote sharing power with the Slavic people. The act put a lot of countries in a difficult position with regards to allegiance. Russia had backed the Serbians, so Austria-Hungary turned to Germany for help. Germany agreed, but only if Austria-Hungary used military force against the Serbians. Germany then realized they were stuck between the allies of Russia and France. Germany officially declared war on Russia on August 1, 1914. Two days later, they had gathered forces on the border of Belgium, which was at the time neutral, and declared war on France. Belgium called on Britain to help, and on August 4, 1914, World War I began. During the war, Russia suffered many defeats, prompting the rise of the Bolsheviks, a far-left Russian radical group. They staged a coup against the Russian royals, which resulted in the execution of Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family, ending Russia's monarchy and prompting the establishment of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. After the war ended, the Treaty of Versailles was drawn up and the League of Nations began to form. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was broken up and Austria and Hungary became separate states. Poland was restored and gained territory. Greece and Italy gained land and Romania doubled its size. Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia formed, and Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania were granted independence from Russia. The Ottoman Empire completely collapsed. Unfortunately, many people in Germany felt that the Treaty of Versailles was unfair, and Germany fell into economic decline. The German Workers' Party took advantage of the political climate of post-war Germany. 
they appealed to the country's hurt national pride, so much so that some people overlooked some of the more extreme ideas of the party's new and charismatic leader. Others embraced the ideas that were being spouted, as it placed the hardships they were suffering squarely on someone else's shoulders. It wasn't long before Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party took Germany to war. One point of contention for Germany was the reform of Poland. In September 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, causing Britain and France to declare war on Germany. At first, Russia, which was ruled by the communist leader Joseph Stalin, aided Germany. Hitler and Stalin agreed to divide Poland between them and invaded Poland from both sides, meeting at an agreed dividing line in the middle. However, Stalin eventually realized Hitler's true intentions to invade and conquer Russia. Russia joined the Allies, and although they suffered more casualties and devastation than any other country that entered the war, the German army never reached the Russian capital of Moscow. Although allied during World War II, tensions rose between the United States and the Soviet Union through a clash of ideals. During the Yalta and Potsdam conferences, the division between the leaders of the Soviet Union and the United States came to a head. During the Potsdam conference, Harry Truman talked about the American Manhattan Project and their development of nuclear weapons. Truman and Stalin were highly distrustful of each other, and this meeting started them on the path to the nuclear arms race, the Cold War, and the concept of mutually assured destruction. The conflict between the USSR and the US was waged with propaganda. Thankfully, the war was primarily political and economic rather than military. After several decades of political turmoil, in 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as president of the Soviet Union, and Boris Yeltsin became the president of Russia. The USSR was dissolved, and the 15 republics that made it up gained independence, although some had declared their independence before Gorbachev resigned. Today, many places in Eastern Europe are favorite tourist destinations. With its unique architecture, varied cultures, and tumultuous history, Eastern Europe has a lot to offer. However, whether the region can shake off its legacy of warfare is yet to be seen. Russia is still seen as a dominating and volatile force by the West, and historical scars still run deep in many communities. Michael Corder wrote, In Eastern Europe, the past is not only hovering over the present, it waits like some malevolent caged beast, ready at any moment to escape and bring back all the horrors. Who knows what the future has in store for the region? We can only hope that the beast of the past stays in its cage. To learn more about Eastern Europe, check out our book, History of Eastern Europe, a captivating guide to a shortened history of Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Moldova, Belarus, and Romania. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.